In this video, we're going to be looking at dams and energy. This is the fifth video in the in topic four, what decides how fast a river flows. In this video, we're going to be considering dams and hydroelectric power plants. So there was a big scheme in the 1950s and 60s in Australia called the Snowy Mountain Scheme where the government undertook the damming of a lot of rivers in New South Wales and Victoria in order to irrigate a lot of land and to generate electricity. As part of this scheme, they built 16 dams, seven power stations, a pumping station and 225 kilometres of tunnels, pipes and aqueducts. So in doing this scheme, they built dams which flooded a lot of land and there was a few towns including Adaminibi that needed to be moved as at the old site of Adaminibi is now under Lake Eukamine which was formed by the damming of the river. So this photo shows Lake Eukambeen a few years ago. Lake Eukambeen is a completely man-made lake. A few years ago there was a big drought and the level of the lake dropped a lot. And you can actually see that all the trees which were flooded when you, Lake Eukambeen was formed have now started to appear again. So this is actually revealing the old town site of Adaminibi before it was moved to its new location. So let's consider now how hydropower plants work. Hydropower plants work by basically converting the gravitational potential energy of the water in the river into electrical energy. So to understand how this happens, we first need to understand the law of conservation of energy. So we've met the law of conservation of energy briefly before and we'll be looking at it again later. The law of conservation of energy is a very, very important law in physics. So what the law of energy conservation says is that energy in the system is always conserved unless you add energy to the system. So there's two ways of adding energy to the system. One is to do work on a system and one is to add heat to the system. So in the kettle we were adding heat to the system. What we're going to be looking at now is doing work on the system to increase its energy. So there's two main ways that energy can be stored within a system. One is as potential energy and the second is as kinetic energy. So potential energy is a kind of stored energy. One way to store the energy is in the gravitational potential energy. And kinetic energy is the energy of movement. So when something's moving, it's got a lot of kinetic energy. So let's look at gravitational potential energy now. So gravitational potential energy near the surface of the Earth is given by the formula U, which is the symbol for gravitational potential energy, is equal to m times g times y, where y is the height of the object. So let's consider how this equation comes about so that we can work out the limitations on this equation. So we've said that to change the energy of a system, we need to do work on the system. So consider this jug of water on the floor. If I lift it up, how much work am I going to do on it? Well, work is equal to the force that's applied times the distance that the object is moved. So first of all, have a think, what force do I need to overcome to lift that jug up? Hopefully you realise that it's the weight force caused by the gravitational force which I need to overcome to lift the jug up. So let's call this initial height Y1. Now what I'm going to do is lift the jug up. I'm doing work on the jug to overcome the gravitational force and it's now at a height y2. So the change in the height between the floor and here is given by y2 minus y1. And so we could call that h. h is equal to y2 minus y1. And the gravitational force is given by mg. And so the amount of work I've done to lift it is given by mgh or mg times the change in y. 
And so because I've done that amount of work on it, I've given it that amount of energy, and that is what has caused the change in its gravitational potential energy. So it now has that energy stored in here just by being at this height. If I let go, it can now fall back to the Earth and gain kinetic energy as it does so. So let's do that now. Here's the water going back down. So as the water falls back down, it's gaining kinetic energy. Now it's possible to put a paddle wheel or a turbine in its path and the falling water can then do work on that turbine. So we're effectively converting the gravitational potential energy into work done on the turbine, which in turn gets changed into electricity. So let's do an example now of using the MGH formula. Before we do an example, let's just consider one thing. What would happen if I had the jug of water and I moved it horizontally, but I didn't change its height, its height remained the same. What would happen to the amount of work done on the jug in this case? Well, in this case, work is equal to the force times the distance. But in order to apply this equation, the force and the distance or displacement actually need to be in the same direction. So in this case, the force that I am overcoming is the weight force. And that is actually perpendicular to the direction that I was moving the object. So in the case where we move an object horizontally and the only force being applied is the gravitational force, you do not do any work. So the work is actually equal to zero because these are perpendicular to each other. Okay, so the question is, 480,000 megalitres of water is stored in Lake Eukenbean. The dam wall is 116 metres high. If all this water was to be released from the dam, how much gravitational potential energy would be lost? You may assume that the average height of the water is half the height of the dam. So we have a dam wall like this. It's 116 metres high. We have it filled with water. So the top part of the water is at 116 metres. Down here we're at zero metres. And so the average height is half this height here, which is what this is telling us. And so to calculate the change in gravitational potential energy, we've got that U is equal to mgh. And now, so we need to work out what mass of water falls from what height. So we've got 480,000 megalitres. So that's 480,000 times 10 to the 6 litres. And because it's water, 1 litre is 1 kilogram. So that has converted it into kilograms. And then we times it by 9.8. And then we need to times it by the height it falls. Well, the top part falls from 116 metres, but the bottom part falls 0 metres. So the average height is 116 on 2. And this is equal to 58 metres. So we can type all this into the calculator. When we do that, we get 2.73 times 10 to the 14 joules. So an awful lot of energy would be released if all this water was allowed out through the dam. So one of the limitations on this U is equal to mgh equation is this g. This little g only works close to the surface of the earth. Close to the surface of the Earth, we've got that the weight force is equal to mg. 
Whereas when we move further and further away from the Earth, we need to use the equation f is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared, where this is the mass of the Earth, and this is the mass of whatever, whatever object we're considering. So as you move further and further away from the Earth, this little g actually changes and gets smaller and smaller. And so this gravitational potential energy equation only holds for objects on the surface of the Earth. Hydroelectric power plants have several advantages. One of these advantages is that they're considered relatively environmentally friendly. The main adverse environmental effect comes from when the dam is built. At the moment, the Three Gorges Dam is being built in China. This is the biggest dam that has ever been built. And as a result of the building of this dam, a lot of land has been flooded, which has meant that a lot of small townships have had to be moved. However, when you're producing hydroelectricity, you do not release any greenhouse gases, such as in the burning of coal, etc. So actually generating the electricity doesn't have inverse consequences for the environment. A big advantage of hydroelectric power stations is that they can actually provide electricity very much on demand. If there's a lot of electricity in the system, so there's actually spare electricity, then rather than generating electricity, these hydro power plants can be used to store that energy. So they can actually pump water from a lower height to a higher height, and so that increases the gravitational potential energy stored in the water and is actually a way of storing that energy. If there's then a high demand for the electricity, the water can move down from the high height to the low height, and as it does so, its gravitational potential energy is released, and if it goes through a hydropower plant, converted into electrical energy. So let's consider exactly how a hydroelectric power plant works. Here's a diagram showing you a hydroelectric power plant. You can see that we're not actually taking the water from the very top of the dam, we're actually taking it from near the bottom, which makes a lot of sense because if the level in the dam drops, you don't want to be left high and dry without any water flowing through your power plant. So this doesn't actually affect the amount of energy that the power plant can get. That's because at the bottom of the water here, the water is at a high pressure due to the weight of all the water above it. So the work that the water can do is given by the force times the distance, and force which it can supply is given by the pressure times the area. So as the pressure increases due to the increase in depth of the water, the force that it can apply to the turbines increases, and so the amount of work it can do increases. So it actually turns out the same as removing water from the very top of the dam. So we've said that the amount of power generated is equal to the energy over the time. So hydroelectric power plants have an efficiency. So efficiencies are always between 0 and 1, and they basically tell you how good a power plant is at converting the supplied energy into the output energy which goes into electricity. So hydroelectric power plants are very efficient. They have efficiency constants close to one. So the amount of power is equal to the energy lost from the gravitational potential energy over the time times the efficiency. So the gravitational potential energy change, remember, is given by mgh, where h is the change in height of the water. So in the video two in this topic, we saw that the volume flow rate was given by the cross-sectional area times the velocity of water through that point, which is also equal to the volume of the water that flows through a point over the time. And we said that density is equal to mass over volume. So we can say that volume is equal to the mass over the density. So the volume flow flow rate is also equal to the mass over the density times the time. So let's combine all those equations now. So the power 
supplied by the power plant is given by MGH times the efficiency, which will give the letter K over the time. And now we can replace the MT in that equation with rho AV. So the power supplied by a power plant is given by rho, the density of water flowing through it, times A, the cross-sectional area, times V, the velocity, the flow rate. So AV together are the volume rate of flow, times G, times H, times K. So let's do an example now of using that equation. So the question is, calculate how much power is generated by a hydroelectric power plant through which 22 metres cubed of water flows each second. The water is 120 metres above the bottom of the dam and the plant is 80% efficient. So we're going to need to use our formula that the power generated is equal to the density times the volume flow rate, AV, times G, times the height of the dam, times K, the efficiency. So we know the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per metre cubed. Now this is the volume flow rate and we're told that 22 metres of cube, cubed of water flows through it each second. So this AV is just 22. Now G, that's just the acceleration due to gravity, so 9.8. H is the height of the water above the dam, which is 120 metres. And then K is between 0 and 1. 80% means that it's 80 over 100, or 0 0.8. So now all we need to do is put that into the calculator. So when we do that, we get 20... 697,600 watts. So we can write this as 20.7 megawatts, where mega is 10 to the 6. So this is how much energy would be generated in a relatively small hydropower plant. Some hydropower plants can generate a lot more electricity than this. So in this video we've seen that dams can be used to store water and actually raise the height of the water. We can then release energy from dams in a hydropower plant by letting the water flow through and do work on a turbine. As the water loses that gravitational potential energy, that energy goes into work on the turbine and that can be used to produce electricity. In a later topic, we'll actually be looking at exactly how this produces electricity. It actually turns out that you have a coil of wire turning in the magnetic field, and this actually generates an electric current. So special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming this, and thanks to this person for providing an image that we used with the Creative Commons license.